thank you very much for being here. I have been into the field of Internet of Things uh, since about uh, 10 years. That is when computers become a part of every physical object. So when physical objects become a bit smart, and together they found a new layer on the Internet. But then my colleagues and I were sitting together and saying, okay, what's new? What could we do? How could we contribute uh, in the future? And then two things actually happened. Two things happened. The first thing is uh, my colleague Andreas Hermann, who is a behavioral economist, approached me and said, hey, can't we use your smart products to change the behavior of people? And then something else happened at the same time. Um, um, I saw this one when I was working with a company that produces stuff like that. This is a toothbrush, right? And the toothbrush is a smart toothbrush. So it, uh, if you switch it off, turn it on, it communicates with a display, which is on a mirror somewhere. And what would it do? As soon as you switch it on, it would count up the seconds. So you'd know how long you are brushing your teeth. And it would also show here which quarter of your mouth you would uh, clean. Up right, up left, and so forth. And uh, if you apply too much pressure, it would tell you don't, right? So I thought, well, that seems like what I want to do. I bought it and uh, asked my kids to use it. You know what? You can't stop my children anymore from cleaning their teeth. Yeah? Because after two minutes, it shows a smiley. And I always want to see that smiley. And it's even worse if I try then um, to help my children. They're very small, you know, very small, like organ pipes. They say, Daddy, now you need to do up here. Because it shows where she should clean. So this little computer influences my children. It's a toothbrush and it uh, takes over some of the duties of uh, my education. So I said, okay, this is the direction we want to go. So we combine Internet of Things, smart products, with behavioral economics, but hopefully for the good. So for how to conserve electricity, save power, and uh, conserve water. Now let me briefly introduce to these two subjects before coming then to the lab experiments I want to show you. First of all, we're talking about smart things. This is like, uh, you know, the computers get smaller and smaller and smaller all the time, as you see on this line. As soon as they're so small that you don't, that cannot see them anymore as computers, but you only see the physical things. So we call that ubiquitous computing, when computers are in everything. And here I brought you an example of a ubiquitous computer. So this is actually, it's a box you need for replenishment for screws in companies. So this is a typical great example of a ubiquitous computer. You don't see the computer. You see it in shelves like this. Many Swiss and other companies use it already. And once it's empty, you know, the worker only has to turn around the box. And then you see here, that's the big difference. There's a little computer on it. And it realizes that it's empty. And it sends a wireless signal to one of these things here. And uh, then to the SAP system of uh, a company that replenishes it automatically. Now this sounds like a very stupid, simple step. But in fact, it's a big step. It changes the entire process on how you do replenishment. And it's just a small step, but it won uh, the European Logistics Award because it's a huge thing. So we want to make computers small and uh, so you don't see them anymore and easily usable, so no entering stuff anymore. The other field I'd like to talk about is, is uh, behavioral economics. Um, in the world of Dan Ariely, who I like a lot, as a king in that discipline, uh, behavioral economics really investigates the hidden forces that drive our decisions. I just bring you one example so to get a clue around what behavioral economics is all about. Now, one of these decisions is really, do we want to donate our organs, yes or no? It's an important decision we would maybe once in our lifetime. Uh, to do so, you get forms like this, right? Now, there is two types of forms you find across the world. One type of form really shows um, here uh, this alternative, which says, well, anyway, it says check the box below if you want to donate. So if you don't check, you don't donate, right? And another alternative is just the opposite. Check the box below if you don't want to donate. So if you don't check, you join. Now, having to make a very, let's say, important decision, you'd think we don't care about how we ask questions. But that's not the case. The framing of how we present information really changes the way we act. 
Um, and this is the proof of it. Here is the statistics that show across many countries how many people donate their organs. You see the first countries here, from Denmark uh, to Germany, they don't, don't donate anymore, or only a few of the people. And the other donate a lot. So what's the difference? It's not, it's not culture. It's not deep thinking. It's the form. The form decides what we do. So we act absolutely irrational in a predictable way. You should know that, say, when you get up every morning, don't think ever that you make decisions on your own, but the form you fill in, decide for you, basically, at the very end. This is also true for male academics who are technicians, <laughs> right? And most of you are at least uh, uh, some, somehow tech-savvy. So now let's look at these uh, two things and combine them. How can we use technology? Um, that leverages the effects of behavioral economics for the good. Here is one example. The first example is Felix. Felix really is um, uh, it's a, it's a research project, but most important, it's a portal. Utility companies use to help their customers save energy. So this is a big experiment we made with an Austrian a uh, utility uh, company experiment made by ETH Zurich and US University of St. Gell. And most important that customers really like to do uh, save energy, it's, it's a game, it's a power saving game. So how would it work? First of all, if you enter the portal, if you do it, then we would ask you to go to the basement to find the electricity meter, note down the level of electricity you used, Currently, go up and enter it. So people do that. Why do they do that? Now the gaming part comes in, because they can earn points. So if you do it, you get 10 points, whatever they are good for, right? So you enter data and get points. That's the basic idea of this very portal. You not only uh, uh, get points by doing so, you also get presents. You get iTunes stuff, you get e-bike rides. Stuff. So it's a kind of a lottery as well. But you also gain insights. You, for instance, gain insight on how much electricity did you use last week compared to the weeks before, compared to the years before, compared to your neighbors, compared to the village you live in, because we have all this data from the utility company, of course. Uh, we also show you the absolute amount you use. Maybe for some of you this is interesting. But we also show you uh, well, what kind of guy you are. Are you an A guy when it comes to electricity, or a B guy, or a C guy? Right? We show many things. Also, we give tips. People who play around in the portal uh, see tips, right? Uh, how can I save energy? And at the end, of course, we give some basic education. Now you will wonder, if you would have a portal like that, would you ever use it? Well, we wanted that too. That's why it's an experiment, right? Uh, um, you know, with giving points, with playing games, with giving presents, actually people use it heavily heavily for a long time. So I'll give you the numbers in a second. And of course, we are researchers. So what we try to do is find out which of the behavioral economics effects works best. So we divided the entire population of people in different groups and gave them different, um, uh, and gave them different feedbacks. So one group, we said, well, can you use these numbers like kilowatts, for instance? One group, we gave them uh, feedback on, you know, you need the historical data, how did you develop over time? Another group, we gave absolute feedback, in this case, descriptive feedback, another one, injunctive feedback. So what did we find out, just on a scientific base? We did find out very many interesting things when, and added to the literature of the economic, uh, of behavioral economics. For instance, injunctive feedback, that's the stuff here with the smiley, that's the, the superior feedback. People want to be assessed. They want to know, even if a computer tells them, you are good or not so good. They change behavior if a computer tells them that they are good, they are not so good. We learned that descriptive feedback is only good for the people who are not very, uh, who, are, who are below average in energy consumption. Uh, or if, if you use less energy than the average, and you see that you are better than the others, you increase energy consumption. Right? Because we always measure feedback against energy consumption at the very end, right? Uh, and of, we, we also learned that, you know, kilowatt hours, nobody has a clue what it really means, so nobody uses that stuff. 
So let me tell you a few things about the results of the experiment. First of all, uh, over 7,000 households registered in this area. This is more than 5% of the entire population, which is a huge number for a university experiment. Of course, the people didn't know it's an experiment. It just took place. The users stayed on board. Once you enter data, you stay on, you stay on board all the time. We have more than 100,000 meter readings. So this is the preparation for smart meters, right? Once you enter the data manually and you use, you consume them, you also can use the smart meter data later on. People consume more than 400 days uh, energy consulting. So they, we, we of course uh, scan exactly and note exactly where they browse through. So we learned that they're really eager to learn about these tips and use them. Half of the households gave us their mobile number, and every Saturday they get an SMS. And uh, that's funny, because then the children say, Daddy, Felix did send an SMS. Uh, we should go to basement to enter the new meter level, right? And then people report stuff like, um, Daddy, Mom, Switch off, the wind, uh, switch off the light, Felix doesn't like it. <laughs> so Felix became a person uh, for many. Now, we did then some strange games. For instance, we ask the households via the portal, please try to stop your meter. Two over 2,000 households uh, played the game. You can see it in the numbers, of course. So what did they do? They went into the basement, for instance, and switched off there was the, those were the smart ones, the general electricity circuit, right? And then report later in the blog, well, that's what we did, and it worked, the meter stopped really, but we had to readjust all the watches, <laughs> for instance. And others said, well, we switched off everything, even refrigerators, but still the meter was turning, so we went to the attic, and we found an old VC recorder, right? So we switched them up with a high standby uh, power, usage. So we switched that off. So we got lots of blocks and lots of entries. At the end, the result is the following. Overall, we could reduce energy consumption by 3.6%. This seems to be a small number, but in fact, it's not. If you multiply exactly these results, at least, uh, for instance, to a population like Germany, you would uh, generate power um, of, for more than 70,000 households. Uh, you would reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, uh, you would need to grow half or two-thirds of the Bavarian woods, for instance, so it's a big number. Just uh, working with behavioral uh, economics at a very low-cost project, of course. Now let me go to uh, another project, this is Happily Saving Water. So trying again to come up with a mixture of technology and, and behavioral economics. Now, um, saving water is, I mean, here in Switzerland we don't need to save water really that much, but there is many countries where Drinking water is a scarce resource, so you should do that. Now, um, it's not only the drinking water, but it's also the carbon footprint you generate via hot water. It's the fourth, the, the, the fourth biggest actually resource of carbon footprints in households. It's 10% actually of a CO2 emissions you find uh, in, in a developed country. So it's important to reduce the warm water consumption. How do you do that? So we made out something. Here we developed this, this thing here. This is a little turbine. So inside this thing you find a little turbine. When water runs through, it turns. Thus it generates power. Then it runs a integrated in microcontroller that counts how often it would turn. So it counts actually the water flow. It measures the temperature. And it generates enough energy to kind of wirelessly communicate it to the bathroom. So this is a power generator, actually, uh, uh, for the bathroom. And you can do things like this. You put it, actually, uh, between the shower and the shower head. And as soon as you open up the shower, it starts turning, and it starts showing you how many liters you are using. It also shows you the temperature. And of course, knowing behavioral economics, we expect that you would reduce the consumption. Now here is what we found out, and this is Torsten. Uh, Torsten, of course, is from Germany, as you might recognize uh, from the name. Uh, and he's really the brilliant brain and head who is doing all this research, who has most of the ideas. 
And Torsten started off with 70 liters. You know, when we come to the office in the morning, we ask each other, how many liters did you use today? So if you, you know, things you cannot measure, you cannot manage, but now you can measure. So we have, now, we have an idea how much water you use. I think you have no idea how much water you use. Now Torsten has seen what he does and now uses 50 liters. Uh, right. So then there's this other guy, Stefan, he's a mobile uh, phone programmer, very weird, wonderful, nice PhD candidate of myself. He started off with 160 liters, right? Even showering on his own, right? So I, I mean, <laughs> no, why do you have to mention that? I mean, and he insisted, he insisted that he really behave very well now, which means that he's down to 50 to 60 liters. Uh, why? He changed his behavior, yes but also he changed uh, his shower head, because some shower heads are more intelligent than the others. They use more air and stuff like that. So change of behavior, just seeing what you're doing, uh, is a very, very powerful force. Of course, being scientists a bit, you know, we, we of course play tricks again. So we have a big experiment going on with 200 of these things here, two single households distributed. 50 of those, they count up from zero to however, whatever you use. 50 of the things, you know, they count from 50 liters down to zero, and we know from behavioral economics, people hate to go below zero. You don't do that, so you feel a pressure, you stop, right? And then we have uh, other tricks going, colors and stuff like that. And the idea is that we want to see which one works best on the long run, not just on the short run. And uh, we generate diagrams like this. Uh, this is just to show up a bit, uh, I'll show off a bit. Anyway, we expect the reduction uh, of water consumption, uh, the first results show that, of about um, 8 to 10 percent, which is huge, without losing any quality. For most people on average, it's on average. There's always people who really don't care, right? But it's okay. And there's people who care a lot, who smell a lot, then maybe also. Anyway, uh, just to summarize, what we found out, uh, Using the Internet of Things, things can communicate, and things which will not communicate in the future because they don't have a computer, they will be dead, right? And we want to have living things, of course. Behavioral economics works. It works also if computer pat your shoulders. If computers tell you what to do, you like that, you do that. And then, of course, if you join that, if you have direct feedback, real-time feedback, I think we multiply the effects. Don't think ever again. If you see a smart product that you decide, you know, the thing decides more or less for you, but makes you feel happy. At the very end, of course, we can use that for the good. Not only for electricity and water, but also for fighting ob obesity, for uh, making our car driving behavior better, and all the other things which we're doing research. So, I just would like to say, in the future, let's design this stuff, experiment this stuff, and learn. Thank you very much. <laughs>